Uh, good morning. Happy Halloween. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm Kevin McPartland, Head of Market Structure and Technology Research for Coalition Greenwich. I'm very excited for today's Behind the Market Structure. Uh, SEC Commissioner Peirce has taken some time out of what is clearly a very busy schedule to speak with us uh, about the market structure evolution we're in the midst of today. Uh, we'll talk about equities, fixed income, crypto, ESG, a uh, host of other things. Uh, our uh, number one market structure trend to watch that we wrote back in January of 2022 was, in fact, the SEC. And so I very much look forward to exploring uh, the SEC's agenda uh, over the next half an hour or so. A few short points before we get started. Um, we are recording this discussion and we'll send out a copy and a brief write-up in a few days, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, and when we're done, uh, you'll be prompted to let us know what you thought of the webinar today, so please take the two minutes to respond. We definitely do look at what you say. Uh, and now with that behind us, uh, Commissioner Peirce, um, some background, was appointed by former President Trump and was sworn in in January of 2018, uh, which means she has a five-year anniversary, five anniversary quickly approaching. Um, before starting her current role as commissioner, she conducted research at George Mason University, uh, worked as senior counsel for the Senate Banking Committee, and before that, uh, worked at the SEC uh, as an attorney in various roles. Uh, so, Commissioner, thank you so much for being here today. Well, Kevin, it's a delight to be with you, and uh, I, I want to start with my standard disclaimer, which is that the views that I represent are my own views as a commissioner, and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. And I'm sorry that I can't uh, be there on video, but I'm glad to to be with you uh, on audio. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. The audience will be stuck uh, just looking at me for the whole time, but they'll be they'll be listening to the to the conversation. Um, and so we have so much to talk about. So I really should just jump right in. Um, so let's start with a little bit of background. So you both you worked both in legislative and obviously now regulatory roles in your time in Washington. How are they different? How did one shape the approach of the other? It's really valuable to have uh, worked both for for Congress and then for the SEC because you do get two different perspectives. So when I was when I was in private practice, I had no idea how valuable it would be to work at the SEC because you learn things from inside the building that you you really can't learn from outside the building. Um, and you learn about how much there is that goes on besides what you see, you know, as the actions of the commission. A lot of what the staff is doing on a daily basis is really consequential. And then going from the SEC to work uh, on, at the Senate and doing that at the time the financial crisis was breaking out into full public view in, in 2008 was really a chance for me to, one, contemplate the consequences of, of regulation done wrong, uh, and two, contemplate the role of the Congress with respect to the, the agencies and vice versa. And so I really developed a respect for the role of Congress in telling us what we should do as an agency. And then now that I'm, I'm back at the agency, even when there are mandates that I have fundamental philosophical or, or economic problems with, if Congress told us to do it, I think it's our job to implement that mandate and to do so with great respect for the consequences of what we're doing, but understanding that Congress did tell us to do something, so we have to do something. I can, I can convey my concerns about potential unintended consequences of, of a legislative mandate, but it is my responsibility to put that into practice. And I think the, the oversight role of Congress is a really important one as well. We're, we're working for the American people and they're the representatives, representatives of, American, of the American people. And so it's their responsibility to make sure that we're doing our job the way they want us to do it. Yeah, yeah and that's a good reminder for everybody, right? How closely the sort of the SEC, the CFTC for that matter, have to work with Congress, right? That it really is a partnership. It is. I mean, it's a partnership, but it's not an equal one. They're they're certainly uh, in charge. <laughs> um, so so let's talk about technology for a minute. Again, sort of we'll, we'll st stay high level to get started. Um, there's been so much great innovation in the market over the last uh, five, ten years, let alone the last two or three. 
Um, where are you seeing the most interesting innovation from a bar construction perspective? What types of firms, what type of technology do you, do you get excited about? Well, there's a lot that's going on that I think is, is really exciting. And I was thinking recently, so I, I, I first came to the SEC in around 2000. And so it's been, it's been 22 years and that's, that's a long time uh, in the markets and a lot has happened. Technology has moved so quickly in that time and the, the, the way that the markets look now is so different than the way that they looked back then. So I think the speed is really, is really a lot of people complain about the speed of our markets now, but it, it is, I think, fascinating to see how that's transformed the marketplace in a way that I think ultimately is good for retail investors. They can go anytime to the market and they can get their orders filled at a, at a price that they see on their screen. And that's a valuable thing. Um, I, I do think that there is a lot of a lot of potential for artificial intelligence to change our markets to continue to change our markets and um, for that to also change the way we regulate markets and that's that can be valuable um, i think there's some interesting potential for innovation using blockchain um, i don't know that we'll allow that to move forward but i think that there's there's some interesting um, innovation there i think in general the markets are a little bit stymied by a, a regulatory structure that is quite um, it, it's quite strict and it, it doesn't allow for as much room for innovation as I'd like to see. So I think if we could figure out a way to um, to to unleash technology a bit more and to allow people to come from outside of the financial sector and apply technologies that they're using outside the financial sector in the financial sector, we would be we would be better off. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Right. I mean, from my pers perspective, you know, communications, collaboration, right. That was something that we've seen a lot of innovation really since the start of the pandemic. But obviously there's been some stumbling blocks for the market there. Correct. But I mean, I think that that's exactly that's exactly the right kind of thing to look at that kind of technology, which has its origin outside of the financial system to bring that into the into the financial system and into the way our markets work is really exciting but we we live in a very permissioned world inside inside the uh, capital markets and so it's really hard for people to try on a small scale to experiment with things and you're right the the pandemic sort of forced experimentation and maybe forced a more um, liberal attitude on the part of regulators because it just by by virtue of necessity um, but it shouldn't take a pandemic to allow that kind of thing to happen yeah yeah because it's brought so much progress in other industries um, so so you know recent volatility um, has certainly exposed some areas in need of improvement in u.s market structure but then on the other hand, market structures held up quite well, right? Like, to your point, right? The speed, the amount of volume that's gone through the system despite the volatility has been pretty impressive to watch. So how do you look at that from your perspective? Has it uh, uh, sort of sh shown a light on areas that need improvement or do you really feel like the market has functioned quite well under the circumstances? Well, Kevin, I agree with you that the market has really, the, the pipes of the market have held up really quite well under extraordinary circumstances. From my perspective, it's it's extremely important to allow markets to work, especially when you have times of uncertainty and and there there um, things happening in the world that are difficult to make sense of. The markets are very helpful at at making sense of those moments and incorporating a lot of people's different uh, different people's thoughts on on where things are going. And so keeping the markets up and running is is really important. The markets did that quite well during. March 2020 during the the uh, meme stock trading events, but are there things that that we saw during the, those times too that made us think maybe we need to do things differently? Sure, um, we're talking about shortening the settlement cycle. It's always helpful to uh, take risk out of the system to shorten the settlement cycle. So I think that's an important project that we're working on. Um, we we have seen some dislocations in the treasury markets that are concerning and you know certainly treasury markets are are fundamental to all of the rest of our financial markets here and abroad and so we need to make sure that that those markets work 
well, and and I think we're all um, we're all focused on that. Um, and then, look, you're always looking to see whether the the regulations that you put in place before um, to increase financial stability are working as intended. Are they are they constraining liquidity uh, in times of crisis? And that's something that I think we really need to pay attention to. You can you can build a, a um, a system that that you're thinking always about financial stability, but then if it doesn't work in time, in a time of, of crisis without intervention from the Fed, for example, then you have to ask yourself: Is there are there some tweaks that we can make? Right, right. Is it is it is it um, you know there are times I guess when we need more incentives for for people to get involved in a marketplace, and then there are other times when additional oversight right will help. Um, in these times of stress, and it's finding that balance. It's finding the balance, and and it's it's finding a, a system that you don't have to come up with a, um, you know, the, the markets function, and there are are ways to address problems that are sort of built into the market. You don't have to come up with emergency programs um, when sure. there are problems. Sure, sure. So I'm going to so get to the, some specific out. proposals in a minute, but if we could start off with what you think is the most important set of proposed rules right now and then i guess the converse to that is uh, which set of proposals that are out there are, are just are not worth the time right and we should be focused elsewhere well the last list is a long list the the, the rules that i think are good that we're, we're working on now as i mentioned shortening the settlement cycle um, trying to get uh, some more disclosure around around short selling might be a valuable thing to do, but we have to be very careful in how we're doing it. Um, that's that's a difficult one to, to calibrate. Um, so I would say those are probably those are probably the the ones that I would say right now are most important, although you know maybe you ask me a different day, you'll get a different different set of answers. Fair enough, fair enough. So so let's talk about fixed income for a little bit. You mentioned treasuries. Um, from our perspective, the bond markets have evolved a lot uh, over the past few years, most of it organically, right, based on client demands, tech innovations from the from the providers in the space. Um, that said, there are always ways for, regu you know, regulations to help improve the market structure to move things forward. So you talked about, like I said, about treasuries, but obviously there's proposals out there about corporates, munis, clearing, reporting, registration, the list is long. Um, what do you see as the most impactful place to focus for bond markets specifically? Well, I think we do need to think about treasuries and, and try to figure out what the right thing to do is. But, uh, you know, just globally speaking, yes, I agree with you. Regulation can come in and be helpful. It's always it's always encouraging to me to see organic improvement of markets. I think tre fixed income markets in general are areas where improvements could really help investors and, and retail investors in particular. And so it's nice to see some of that happening without a regulatory push. Uh, I think if, you know, if it were in my control, I would want the SEC to conduct a series of roundtables on the fixed income markets. I would look at each one of the subsector, sub segments of that market um, separately. You know, municipal securities markets are are obviously very important markets and very important to retail investors. So I think there is work to be done there. I would like to see the SEC spend more of its time thinking about that market. Um, and and so I, I hate to I, I hesitate to uh, prescribe remedies, but I think that that these markets do warrant more of our our thinking. Um, right now we're we're in the process of applying 15c to 11 to fixed income markets which i am quite concerned about that's something that not only did we not hold round tables with the public we didn't even have a comment period where the public engaged with us on that issue um, and so that's exactly what i don't want us to be doing if we do think there needs to be more more disclosure and more transparency. That's something that we have to really think about um, uniquely in a fixed income uh, context. Sure. Yeah. No. And that that 15C to 11 um, is definitely you know, still concerning to a lot of the market, despite how 
you know, much work has been put into uh, getting ready for that implementation. I think similarly from, you know, our market conversations, a few others that continue to come up, um, the non-dealer uh, market maker registration requirements for those in the treasury market. Um, I think no one was surprised to see some regulation there to require registration for heavy uh, sort of traders or market makers of U.S. treasuries, although at least from our conversations, a lot of folks feel like it sort of went a little too far in trying to bring in sort of quantitative hedge funds as a for instance. Um, sure. What's been your perspective on that role? Well, so I was, I, I, I supported the idea of trying to put some more context around what a dealer is, um, because I think we've been trying to do that a little bit through our enforcement actions, which is not my preferred approach. But and and certainly trying to pull in some of the some of the market participants in the treasury markets who are you know maybe looking like dealers to to most people i'm I'm open to that idea i you know we need to to think about that too and and that's still still subject to comment of course but I have heard the same concerns that you just raised, which is that we're trying to define dealers so broadly to pull in all sorts of, of entities potentially. I mean, it's it's a little bit difficult to know, but if we do um, pull in entities, maybe some that are already actually regulated or their advisors are already regulated and registered, I'm not sure what we gain by, by um, applying a regulatory, a deal or a regulatory regime to those folks. And, and there seems to be a strand of thinking that if you're active in the market, you must be subject to some kind of a regulatory structure. And I'm just not sure that I'm, I, I agree with that. I, we want people to come and participate in our markets. We want people to be there to provide liquidity. And so I, I think we shouldn't be discouraging um, entities from coming into our markets by saying, well, the, the price you pay for for uh, for being here is that you're going to have to register as a dealer. And some people say, well, it's not a big deal to register as a dealer. Yeah. It, it's it's just it's just a minor inconvenience. Um, but that's that those those are famous last well famous first words to a regular <laughs> slippery slope. Um, we we've seen that with with hedge funds, for example, which you know originally it was just going to be. Uh, very. We just need to know who's out there. We just want to have a sense of, of who the big players are. And then now we're at a point where we're um, trying to regulate the the fees of of private funds. So that's and that that's not been that long of a period of time for that for that transition to happen. Sure. Right. I mean, it goes back to what we talked about. Right. Incentives to participate. We certainly don't want to disincentivize participation in these markets. Right. When well, especially yeah, I mean, especially when you talk about the treasury markets, for example, you really want to have people who are who are willing to jump into those markets during good times and during bad times. And if you if you put requirements like this on, I mean, I think some of what we're seeing now is a product of of requirements and and uh, um, rules put in post dot post uh, financial crisis and. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a long time for the for the consequences of those rules to really um, be seen, and 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 then you have to figure out how to try to try to continue to achieve the objectives of the post financial crisis rules, but try to moderate the the adverse consequences. For sure, yeah. So I could talk about fixed income all day, but we'll, we have to be fair to the other markets. So, so equities, obviously, you mentioned about accelerated settlement. Um, those markets, right, you talked about, right? What twenty-two years? It's about how long I've been in the market as well, right? Have become incredibly efficient and accessible um, over those years, although perhaps a little too complex, depending on your point of view. Where do you think the focus should be for equities markets uh, to improve? Well, so I do agree with you. The complexity, I think, is is concerning because it's it's hard for people, even who are who are very steeped in market structure, to to uh, figure out what's going on and if you tweak something, what the consequences of that will be. So instead of tweaking, Chair Gensler is proposing to conduct a, a pretty major overhaul of market structure. 
um, and I have a couple concerns about that. First, under Chair Gensler, we did make some some changes, and I think it would be nice to see those play out before we start another set to to unroll uh, to roll out another set of major changes. Uh, and second, we really need to be careful to change a market that works quite well. Again, for retail investors, it serves them very well. Are there changes we can make? Sure, but if you if you upset that balance, it could have really adverse consequences for retail investors. And and during a time like the one we're in, where there's a lot of there's a lot of volatility caused by things external to the market, geopolitical issues, um, inflation concerns, those kinds of things. If if we we need to have our markets function very well during times like this because as i mentioned before i think markets are a really important way of processing information of collecting people's views on, on what's going on and so if we break that we've we've broken something that's sort of core to the rest of our well it is core to the rest of our economy and so we want to be very careful and so i'm amenable to certain changes i think changes around uh, 605 um, in for getting better information out to people so they can make better assessments of whether they're they're getting good execution or not those kinds of changes changes around tick sizes um, might might well make sense as well to try to um, better better accommodate what the reality of the market is i think those kinds of changes make sense um, so i i'm i'm amenable to those changes but if you're talking about fundamentally changing the way the whole market operates, we have to be so careful. And yeah, so that's yeah. where, you know, we, it remains, so far we're all operating off, off a speech that Chair Gensler gave, but as we see these things take shape, let's, let's look at that. And even around best execution, certainly one could argue that the SEC, not FINRA, should be the one that has the rule on best execution. Um, but then we have to be willing to approach it with an understanding that best execution for one customer is not the same as best execution for another customer. And so are we really in a position where we can accommodate that? Are we really, um, are, are we really, you know, it's one thing to talk about retail best execution, but do we really want to get into the business of dictating to institutions what best execution looks like for them? I think really what we, want to do is get information out there so that people can make their own determinations about whether they're getting best execution. Yes, correct. Best execution very much in the eye of the beholder, regardless of uh, regardless of asset class, for sure. Um, uh, so so uh, pivot, pivot quickly to crypto. So the chairman has said many times he believes most tokens are securities. I guess the first question is, do you agree? And if that does turn out to be sort of the path forward, can the can the U.S. capital markets handle that? How would that even work? It's certainly a facts and circumstances question, but I would say that one problem with the way we've been approaching this whole whole issue is we are arguing on the one hand that these are investment contracts, that the tokens are sold as part of an investment contract. They're sold with a promise of that, that the token will rise in value because the, there'll be work done on the network and and you'll be able to profit as a purchaser of a token, you'll be able to profit from that, from that work. But we're also, on the other hand, treating the token itself as a security. And the consequences of treating the token as a security mean that secondary trading um, of these tokens all has to occur on, a, on a, a platform that's regulated by us as an exchange or an ATS. Uh, and it, it has all kinds of implications for anyone, um, any institution trying to be an intermediary in, in those markets or provide advice around um, those markets. And so I think that that's just not how we've treated similar assets um, that are part of an investment contract. We've not, we've not gone on to treat that asset itself as the security. So if we're going to do that, we've got to find a way to provide people some relief so that they can operate within our within our capital markets. And we have the authority to do that. Congress gave us 
broad exemptive authority, we could be putting that to work. Instead, we've been spending all of our effort in bringing enforcement actions. And so you've got people who are very, um, very unhappy because they've been waiting for years to try to um, experiment with with crypto and they can't figure out a way to do that consistent with our rules they can't get exemptive they can't get exemptions they can't get no action relief they can't move forward they're burning through their their, their uh, backers money the, the money that people have put into their ventures and so they're just not they're not able to move forward and we're only moving forward with enforcement. And that's just, it's its not a good situation. So people now are looking and they're thinking, well, maybe the CFTC would be a better regulator for us. Congress is looking and, and thinking about what they think the best regulatory structure would be. So we're very much in, in a, a time of flux. I don't know how this is all gonna turn out, but I think if we had handled this differently, going back several years, now we would be in a much different and much better place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting points. I mean, the the uncertainty for those um, sort of entrepreneurs, if you will, in some ways, is you know worse than even new rules that maybe they don't agree with. Right? They just need to know what the rules of the road are so they can move forward. And it's all you know. I talked before about how our financial markets are very permissioned markets where you have to get permission to do anything, and I think that's been frustrating for. Lots of market participants, people who are trying to experiment with things like auctions in the equity markets or um, exchanges when they're trying to do something. It's there. There's a lot of permission involved, but it's even it's even worse in this in this corner of the market because you have a lot of people who are coming in from outside the traditional financial markets. They're smaller entities that just don't have a lot of a, a lot of time to sit around and wait to get approval. Whereas bigger entities, you know, if it's a small experiment that they're trying to run, but it's not their main business, they can afford to wait for a few years, but it's just it's just not the case. And so you you wonder what innovation you're missing out on. For sure, yeah. So so I know we're, we're just about out of your time, but uh, sort of we have one more topic, last but certainly not least, um, ESG, right? So we've been doing a lot of research in the space. Um, you know, institutional point of view over the last year or so, there's definitely a strong demand for more higher quality ESG data um, from investors, um, from uh, from the banks. Do you see this as a sort of a private sector problem to solve, which to, to a large extent, the private sector is, is making quite a bit of, you know, big strides there? Or do you think we need better sort of regulatory driven standards uh, for ESG? Regulatory standards for ESG are, are quite hard, and they're hard both on the issuer side and on the asset manager side. So on, on the issuer side, we have our, our climate rule out, and, and there's a human capital disclosure rule on the agenda as well. And when, when you look at the climate rule and you look at the attempt to provide clarity, accuracy, and consistency, but then you look, you lift, you lift the cover and look underneath that, and you see that you're not really gonna gonna get clarity, consistency, and accuracy. But maybe people will be able to tell themselves that they have that because these disclosures will be baked into SEC filings. But that puts issuers at great legal risk. And I think it it is better to let some of this play out in the in the markets um, as as investors and issuers come together in different industries and figure out what kind of information they they want to see. Um, I think our disclosure rules in general work quite well to elicit material information from issuers, including material risks, which might include for some issuers climate change. For others, uh, there might be human capital risks that might need to be disclosed. Um, but that, that's how I'd like to see it play out. And on the asset manager side, again, we're trying to, we're, we're responding to concerns around greenwashing and we're trying to write rules there. But as it turns out, it's really hard to define what ESG is because ESG changes all the time. And so, um, and changes from person to person. And so we're trying to write rules that are very difficult to write. And, and there's a lot of concern from from asset managers that maybe we didn't get get those rules right. 
And again, I would say our standard disclosure rules work well. If you want to say you're an ESG fund, tell us what that means to you and tell us how you're achieving that. And then let let investors decide whether they share your view of ESG and whether they ch share your approach of achieving it. It's not really different than other than other kinds of um, things that we ask that we ask at asset managers to to uh, disclose, but we don't need special rules, um, mm -hmm. arguably. Now, again, we're getting comment on both the climate rule and the ESG for advisors rules. And so we'll, we'll see where we come out. I'm, I'm still certainly working my way through the many comments that we've gotten on those rules. But again, if we're trying to achieve good results for the climate and for society, the best way to do that is to allow markets to work because again, I come back to this theme that markets are really good at figuring things out because they they combine the knowledge of everyone in society. And so if you if you allow markets to work as they do on their own, then you actually end up with the solutions that solve the major problems society faces, including climate change, um, including concerns around around uh, human capital is kind of, I don't love that term, but around how people are treated in the in the workplace, all of those kinds of issues actually can get worked out better by a market that that um, is allowed to direct capital to the best and highest use. Yeah, well, you've done a fantastic job of summing, uh, summing up the conversation without me even asking, right? Let let natural forces sort of play out as much as we can, right? With um, sort of rules to ensure fair access and to keep uh, keep everything orderly, which you know clearly is, is sort of where you're focused and what you're working on. Yeah, it's easier said than done. So I, I welcome input from anyone who has thoughts about how to do it. And, and certainly my door is always open. And Kevin, I really appreciate this chance to, to spend some time with you. Thank you, Commissioner Purse. That was great. Hopefully some of those round tables you suggested will happen. We can um, we can all see each other and have these conversations sort of in person in Washington in the coming months. Oh, that would be fantastic. Great. Well, thanks so much again for taking the time. We appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. Please do fill out that uh, short survey when we're done, and we will post the recording in a few days. Um, so again, thanks, everybody, for listening. And Commissioner, thanks for your time. That was fascinating. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye.